moment of the night. Uh, I must say on behalf of the board of directors that the selection process uh, was uh, not easy. There were a lot of excellent candidates. But uh, and I want to ask the AV, please do not show any slides. Let's keep the excitement going. It is my absolute pleasure and distinct honor to announce the recipient of this year's award. She has been selected as a result of so many years of exceptional contribution and leadership over the course of her career in bringing indigenous perspectives and knowledge to national and international policy making, in particular on environmental health, sustainability, and preservation. She has raised awareness of the threat of climate change in the Arctic and its relationship to human rights and indigenous rights in Canada and globally. She has been very clearly articulating the interconnectedness of Inuit culture, the environment, the economy, foreign policy, global health, and sustainability. Her work with the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment integrated traditional and Western knowledge and evidence, bringing a human face to climate change in the Arctic. She has inspired the science policy community across Canada with her insights Courage, courage and voice. Ladies and gentlemen, the recipient of the 2022 Science Policy Lifetime Achievement Award is Ms. Shilawat Cloutier. Thank you so much. And uh, my, I think my, my nephew, Robert Watt, who is here, who's also uh, an important player in Ottawa as a director of, uh, at the Canada Language Commission, after hearing all of this incredible scientific world tonight, is thinking, how is my auntie fitting into all of this? <laughs> Uh, but indeed, I am uh, very honored. And when I received the information or the letter from uh, Mary Dad back in August, I believe, uh, I was rather surprised and wondered, okay, the, the uh, Science Policy Center, okay, that's... And then he told me a little bit more. And of course, it was Denise Amiot, I don't know if she's here, who first uh, connected. Are you here? <laughs> And wonderful, and uh, and that was the through LinkedIn she found me, and uh, and that was the start of all of that. So, thank you very kindly to the uh, Science Policy Center and to Mariad who has been contacting me since. So, and uh, and it's been wonderful to get to know what I've heard of Greg Fergus, of course, and uh, nice to meet you in person. And I don't know if Stephanie Meekin made it here tonight. I don't know if she's here. She was one of my advisors when we were working so closely together on the international stage, and particularly with the work of the POPs Treaty, the persistent organic pollutants that were poisoning our country food and the nursing milk of our Inuit women of the Arctic uh, with these um, persistent organic pollutants. And, I just wanted to acknowledge if she is here, I don't know, because her father was not well tonight and she wasn't sure whether she would make it. And I also want to just mention Terry Fenge, the late Terry Fenge, who was my strategic counsel throughout my international elected work that I was doing, and he would be so proud, and he would be very honored 
that I would be here. So I have, I have 20 minutes, and I usually take about 40, 45 minutes, so I'm going to try my very best. I won't keep you 40 minutes, okay. But I want to start just by a quote that, I have, that has really stood by me for many, many years now as a woman doing this work on the international stage. And uh, it's, it's by Louise Bogan, who was an author, and she, of course, since passed away. But this happens to be the epigraph of my book, The Right to be Cold, a little plug for my book for those who haven't read it. Um, and where it really spoke to me, and this stood beside me in a, in, on a paper in front of me for many years, and she said, in a time lacking in truth and certainty and filled with anguish and despair, no woman should be shamefaced in attempting to give back to the world through her work a portion of its lost heart. And so that has stayed with me throughout all of the work that I have done. And what I like to do very briefly, I usually do it in great detail, is uh, speak to you about the, the actual systems and, 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 and history that has really created the health and social problems that we face and challenges that we face in the Arctic because very few people know that context. But I won't go into them in detail because I will expect you to read it in my book, which is a very much in detail. Um, but you know, it, we've come from this uh, really remarkable traditional way of life where I traveled, on, my family traveled only by dog team the first 10 years of my life. And I didn't know any English until I started school at the age of six. And then I was sent away at the age of 10 for school, uh, three years in Nova Scotia, three years at residential school, and three years in Ottawa right here. Um, and so things have changed very quickly for us in one lifetime and in my mother and grandmother's lifetime, certainly. But through that whole process, you know, we have maintained a way of life that we feel so strongly and, and love and want to keep protecting because it's a powerful culture. Where don't, we don't want to just be victims of globalization and commercialization and colonization. We want to become the teachers that will guide and help us. And thank you, I forgot to mention, the wonderful elder who made even me stand up and sing tonight. So thank you for that. That was wonderful. But we went through many, many changes from the, uh, the 1920s, the 1940s, the changes that were made in our lifetime almost overnight as we became fur trappers to meet the global fur market. And then when that collapsed, we went into starvation. And we were guided and helped, in fact, by the American military who arrived during the Second World War to build the airstrips in my region and in up in Iqaluit as well. And that saved the day for us. But things happened overnight. Our spiritual practices were taken away. Our diet changed. Uh, and, and on all of those things that were happening were almost overnight. And schools were being built and we were coerced into communities. And then, of course, the residential schools that were built. Uh, for us, um, we went to Churchill, Manitoba, where it was federally run, not mission run. And then, of course, the forced relocations into the high Arctic in the name of sovereignty, the dog slaughters that happened that very few people know about, the 20,000 dogs that were killed off in the name of health, uh, the seal bans by the misguided emotional stances of animal rights movements, the sexual and physical and emotional abuses that started to happen, leading to the addictions that we see today and the high suicide rates. And so, of course, that was a breakdown of Inuit society. But I, I remember in my living memory before all of that really started to happen. The first suicide in my community happened when I was 18 years old. And so things have happened almost overnight for us. In the 1970s, we started to negotiate our land claims, and of course, we've built some of our own institutions, but certainly there was still loss of land through that process and the relinquishment of some of our own rights. In the 1980s, when we realized we were being poisoned from afar with these persistent organic pollutants and trying to make this an issue 
of health rather than it just being a chemical story or an environmental problem. We worked with the world at the global level, at the UN level, to negotiate this treaty leading to the successful Stockholm Convention because we were able to work in partnership with the scientific community that had built the data and with Health Canada and with our communities. And we were able to influence the world by engaging in the politics of, of influence rather than the politics of protest and really make an impact on making our country food safer today. And so that's where Stephanie and Terry were very um, involved in that work as my advisors throughout that process as we helped to negotiate that convention. And of course now climate change. You know, it's, it's adding to the already very stressed and vulnerable situation that we live in in our communities. The poverty, the poor health, the food insecurities, the housing, and the addictions and the suicides. And so this is yet another assault and another wave of tumultuous change that is happening in our world. And it's very ironic because we're finding that this, the solutions to the problems that we face, many of them, are the answers lie right at home. The answers lie in our culture. So we're finding our culture is the medicine that we seek. And we're trying to teach the world that I think indigenous wisdom and knowledge and Inuit wisdom and knowledge is the medicine the world seeks in better understanding ourselves and understanding sustainability. And that's, and that's why our, I fought so hard and pioneered that work and connection uh, with climate change and human rights because our right, our ability to be Inuit as we know it was being so minimized and destroyed and having seen the first wave and, the, and the, the kind of impacts it's had on my world was a no-brainer for me to say, yes, it is a human right violation for countries, big countries. At the time, we were targeting the United States and the challenges that we had during that period of time. But again, I think even with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights didn't move forward with our petition, our human rights petition, Inuit petition, I think we helped to change the discourse on the language of climate change and really humanized it, where we brought it out of just the realm of politics and economics. And, and we were able to uh, really bring that. But you know, what we had in our arms as well, in our hands, was that remarkable work that we did together with the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment way back when Bob Carell was the, the chair. And he would, he would he, we, we used to call it the Bob and Sheila Roadshow after that came out, because we, he, he would speak the science, and he was a great scientific uh, storyteller, and he was really good at being able to explain all the science while I uh, talked about the human aspect of, of uh, climate change in our world, because the ice is our life force in the Arctic, and it is about mobility and transportation. And when that starts to go, it becomes an issue of safety and security. And of course, our culture is so holistic in the way in which we prepare our children for the challenges and the opportunities of life. And even more so now, it is even more important for the youth who, in our world that is so vulnerable because of the legacy of colonization, the legacy of these historical tra traumas that happened to us so very quickly and almost overnight, where we're reeling from that. And so, because Inuit culture is not, it is very holistic in its approach to preparing our children for life issues. And it's not the tech, just the technical skills of learning how to be a proficient provider and a natural conservationist, but it's also about the patience and the endurance and the courage and the boldness and the persistence and the determination and the res resiliency building, the coping skills that are built and the sound judgment and wisdom we call that silatunuk in our language, in, those, uh, in the way in which we teach our children that. So it's really, and, 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 and those are key. So it's really not just about the ice and polar bears. The world has come to know our world, or our wildlife better than its people. And to try to humanize these issues over the years, 27 years I've been at this, uh, right from the time that I was 
uh, elected with ICC Canada and then later became the chair of ICC, trying to humanize these issues so that we could bring that down to the communities who are really needing to be understood for that history and for our aspirations for our children who are taking their lives in numbers, in, in, in bigger numbers, in the biggest in North America. And the importance of country food. You know, people say, well, what is that so imp why is that so important to you? Because it isn't just the nutritional value of our food. There's also the cultural value, the educational value, the emotional value, the spiritual value, the communal value, and of course, a medicinal value. I usually go into great detail in each of these values, but I don't have that time tonight. Um, so here we are humanizing, trying to humanize these issues of the toxins and climate change because, again, the world doesn't know that context of why we struggle so much. And often people think, is it their inability to adapt to the modern world? No, not at all. In fact, we're probably one of the most adaptable people having because we live in that kind of environment that requires us, us to be extremely focused and adaptable to many situations. So here we are finding that there has been a lot of disconnect in the urban setting because oftentimes people are very busy in the urban, urban setting and not able to uh, connect to each other, to their environment or to their food source. I'm not trying to generalize here completely, but certainly that's the challenge that we've been having for a long time. But we're now in a place, I think, to really, uh, a great opportunity to reconnect to what really matters. And if you haven't had a chance, there's another plug for my TED talk that I gave in 2016 on uh, human trauma and his uh, planet trauma as one. And again, I go into detail on that, but I won't now. Um, if you can take a look at that, that's, that's out there on YouTube. Things will happen slowly because it's taken a long time for us to be where we are today, where we've had those disconnects all over the map on so many issues. And if we could just bring together more of the energies and focus together, uh, then I think it's going to be helpful. But it will happen at the speed of empathy and it will happen at the speed of trust. The more people that understand from a place of deep understanding and empathy, then that's, it will speed up that process of the trusting relationships that we all now need to make. And the pandemic... <clears throat> and the, and the, I think the pandemic, as well as the recovery of the children at the residential schools, have softened, softened and opened up the hearts and minds of more Canadians than ever before. And I think this is, these are the moments that we now have to really just embrace and figure out how do we reconnect back to what really matters to each and every one of us, whether you're Indigenous or non-Indigenous, because this is about all of us. This is about our common humanity. And so it's a grim reminder, though, of how interconnected we all are with the pandemic that has hit us so hard wherever we are. And it has broken open even more widely the unresolved issues of racism and social injustices, not just in the indigenous world, but also in the black communities. And so we can't be blaming just one country or one species for this virus, but what we have been doing to one another and to the habitat of all wildlife for so many years. And many countries are now being fully exposed as a result of this pandemic for their outdated policies and approaches, which are putting even more at risk those who are already existing in poor health conditions and poor health systems. And we certainly know that in the Arctic. And it has given us that time. I never thought in my wildest dreams in the, in the 27 years I've been working on these issues that... Um, a virus would bring all of these unsustainable activities to a halt, but it did. And we saw how the air cleared in many of the cities around the world almost overnight and the animals that surfaced where they had not been before. I'm not suggesting the CO2s went down because that's going to take a lot longer if, uh, because we've got to be addressing these issues and we're not there yet. And you know, we've got some disappointing news very recently about Canada's ranking 
about how we're not doing enough yet to address these issues of our emissions here, and we need to do that. I'm not trying to shame people into doing this, but it's serious stuff that we're talking about now in terms of our children and our grandchildren. And the rhetoric has been there, but the action is not, has not been enough. And we've got to do a lot more here in our country. <laughs> and a lot of these new viruses, of course, as we know, are driven by climate change and the warming. Um, but I was in New Zealand and, and uh, Australia after my book came out and I was on a panel with Tim Flannery. I'm sure many of you know this great scientist from Australia. But we were in New Zealand together. And uh, at the end of the panel discussion I was on with Tim, he was asked the question, what is lacking in us that is not allowing us to take urgent action to address climate change when we know the science is strong and correct. And I would add, corroborated by indigenous wisdom who are the ground truthers on the ground on what is really happening in terms of the changes. So when he was asked, what is lacking in us? His answer, imagination. Imagine we can do things differently. Imagine we can innovate differently. Imagine we can treat these issues differently and create and innovate sustainable um, businesses differently. And I would say, imagine we can tap into the wisdom and ingenuity of indigenous wisdom and add that to the mix there. We'd be going on somewhere that would make a real difference, I think. And so I think we have to reimagine that new way forward with a conscious intention to really make a difference in what we're doing together and not just um, readapt what has not been working for any of us. Values that are based on fairness, on respect for the land, for the environment, for our planet, for each other, and not to waste so much, and perhaps even go back to more basics. So from a human community perspective, the human side of climate change humanizes the issue. And so what does that mean for all of us? It's not, I know science is really strong. I've worked with many scientists. I, in fact, I remember the days of the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment racing to Iceland during those kinds of work that we were doing under the Arctic Council and having the challenge of, of the Bush administration of the, at that time. I, and we thought that was a challenge <laughs> in those days with American politics. But anyway, I won't get into that. Um, and, and, and so I, we stood by. I, I, I even uh, you know, had to fly there on a, a very unexpected trip and stood by the scientists and stood by the science and said, this is really happening on the ground. And yes, it's true what is happening there. And so all of that work that we did with scientists was to also incorporate indigenous knowledge into every chapter of that assessment. And that assessment was even long before, you know, the IPCC reports were coming out. Uh, and it happened to be on the circumpolar world. So I think we also, and I won't get into this now because I don't have much time, um, we have to be thinking about the Arctic, not just in terms of digging up more of the land up there because of it, the accessibility of the uh, of all, you know, what's the resources uh, underneath that melting ice, but to start to think about how do we conserve it? How do we protect it instead? And perhaps even think about and imagine, as Tim would say, use your imagination and ideas for conservation economies that could work really well. And it would be a culture match in the Arctic for our hunters who are so undervalued, but yet they are natural conservationists already, that they would be being paid to protect and to conserve and, uh, the, the areas of the waters and, and, and all of that up there. It would be so affirming, I think, for our people who are so undervalued. And what a better way to reclaim what they lost that was taken from us, our pride, our dignity, our resourcefulness, and our wisdom. Because we are, after all, and I say this all the time, the inventors of the hayak the boat that is replicated worldwide, but we don't have much recognition for that invention. And we can build a home of snow, <laughs> engineer it perfectly. And this is architecture and engineering at its very best. 
And so we don't want to just be victims. We have much to, to offer. Um, briefly, about over a year ago during COVID, I was still up north. I've had to move to Montreal, by the way, because when COVID hit, I was one of those independents that was hit really hard. And for a year and a half, I had no work. I, mean, I couldn't travel. We were locked down in the Arctic. And then when virtual events started to happen, um, the internet is so bad up north. I've had to since move to Montreal. But it's, it's, not a, it's not a huge loss. I have two children, two grandchildren there, so I'm okay. Um, but I was asked uh, to give a keynote, a virtual keynote to 12, maybe some of you were involved, I don't know, 1,200 scientists from 37 countries. It was the Arctic uh, Science Summit uh, hosted by Portugal. Were any of you there on that virtual event? Yes, good. <laughs> Um, and I, so you would recall this quote that I used because I said, okay, I've worked with scientists before, but now it's, it's even more so. We have to seize that moment with scientists as well, where things have to shift. You know, many scientists in the, in the history of the Arctic have come up in the spring and leave in the fall like our geese. And, and sometimes we didn't know what they were studying and we didn't know how we would benefit the guidelines are much better. Scientists are much more open to working directly on the ground with many of our people with a great deal of respect today. But again, we can do better, as the last speaker was saying. We can do better no matter what at every level in every situation in terms of that kind of respect. But I had come across this incredible quote from Gus Speth. You people, I'm sure you've all heard of Gus, uh, the scientist from the USA. And I wondered how these scientists were going to take it, and I used it in my speech, because I wanted to kind of create this opening now, which I try to do in all of the talks that I give about, it starts with us. It's all about inside of us, not our roles, not our titles, not our jobs, but us as person, as human beings, who need to go deeper and go from the head to the heart. I know it's hard for scientists to think that way, but. Many are starting to think that way, to humanize these issues from that perspective. I think it's really important. And this is what Gus said, as, and I quote him. He said, I used to think that top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, environmental collapse, and climate change. I thought that, this is interfering here, I thought that with 30 years of good science, we could address these problems, but I was wrong, he said. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. And so I wondered, hmm, how are they going to take this? Uh, and they lapped it up because these are the most, this was during the pandemic, smack in the middle of it. And we're starting, we were, all of us were, no matter who you were, was starting to deeply think more about what have we, what am I doing in my life? What are we doing? What do we need to do to change our perspectives? What do we need to do to reconnect with what really matters? And that means connect to one another. And so um, they lapped it up and they appreciated it. And, and I quote another as someone else who has really guided me in, in, in my own spiritual journey as well, where she says, personal transformation can and does have global effects. As we go, so goes the world, for the world is us. And the revolution that will save the world is ultimately a personal one. And so it really does come back down to us, because I think without that deep understanding, as I said, uh, speed of empathy and speed of trust that has to be built between so many levels of people and human beings around this world, then here in Canada, truth and reconciliation just won't happen if we don't go into those spaces of the heart. And so we've got to lead with uh, life-centered uh, science, life-centered ways in which we can reconnect to what really matters. And I want to end now very uh, briefly on leadership. And I don't mean political leadership. I mean, we are all leaders in our own right. And we can offer leadership in whatever role we play in this world today. And I was asked by Inuit women who were holding a summit in Iqaluit many years ago when I was teaching at Bowdoin College in Maine 
uh, the human dimension to climate change down there. And they said, we know you're away this year, but we really want to hear from you. And if you could uh, video, have yourself videotaped with this question we're going to ask you, uh, please answer it and then we'll, it, we'll show it in our, in our summit. Uh, for Inuit women who were pri prioritizing because after all, you know, the women, we carry a lot. We're mothers, you know, um, of children and, and our children are so much at risk in the Arctic because of all of these issues. And this really is about our children. Climate change is not just some, you know, about the ice or polar bears, even though those are all really interconnected. But it really is about our children and making sure that they're equipped because those who have had those kinds of traditional upbringing and have learned how not to be impulsive oftentimes can have that integrated much better in the modern stressors of the day because those skills taught traditionally are very transferable to the modern world. And so uh, I was asked, what does leadership mean to you? And this is how I've responded. Leadership to me means never to lose sight of the fact that the issues at hand are so much bigger than oneself. And leadership is about working from a principled and ethical place within oneself, and it is to model authentically, genuinely for others, a sense of calm, a sense of clarity, and a sense of focus. And leadership is to always, always check inwards to ensure one is leading from a position of strength, not fear or victimhood, so one does not project one's own limitations onto those you're modeling possibilities for. And so thank you for this opportunity, and thank you so much for thinking of me to the committee and to others who uh, have thought of me for this uh, remarkable and very appreciative award that you've given me. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.